see you all this evening. You know, the story is told of a man who entered into a diner. He walked up to the counter and he ordered a glass of sweet tea. The waitress brought it out. He took it and immediately threw it in her face. She was astonished, shocked. She ordered the man to leave immediately and don't ever come back until you're cured. The man said, I'll get some help. I'm sorry. I can't believe I did that. I do this on many occasions, and I don't know why I do it. I'll, I'll get some help. I'm sorry. And he leaves the diner. He comes back a few months later, and the lady refuses to serve him. She says, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't ever come back in the diner again. He says, please, I've changed. I've gotten help. I'm cured. Moved by his compassion, she gave him another glass of sweet tea. He immediately took it and threw it in her face. She said, I thought you were cured. He said, well, I am. I still throw tea in people's faces. I just don't feel guilty about it anymore. I think a lot of us deal with guilt in our daily lives. I think a lot of us have dealt with the guilt of past sins. We try to move forward knowing that we have been forgiven by God, but it's much harder, it seems, sometimes to forgive ourselves. Tonight we start a series on Sunday evenings entitled Baggage Claim, looking at the different things that we carry around in our lives that weigh us down, the baggage that we carry needlessly. You know, a lot of times we're like that guy that you see at the airport that's holding two suitcases, he's got two bags under his arms, he's got a backpack and he's got a strap from another bag clenched between his teeth and he's trying to get to the airport and he, and he goes in and he checks his bags and he gets on a plane and he waits at the next airport to reclaim his bags. A lot of us are carrying around baggage like that and we come to church, we drop it at the door, we come in, we worship and we pick it back up as we leave. I want to encourage you throughout this series just to leave your baggage here. Don't take it with you when you leave. It's okay to come in and not feel like you have it all together. This church is not for perfect people. In fact, this church is for the exact opposite. This church is for the people who are messed up, who have all sorts of scars, who carry all sorts of baggage with them. This needs to be a healing place, and this needs to be a place where you can drop off your bags and not have to carry them ever again. The baggage that we're looking at tonight is guilt. And I think guilt is Satan's greatest tool sometimes. It holds us back. It keeps us from being the Christian that we should be and from enjoying the Christian life as God intends for us to enjoy it. Do you struggle with the pain that comes from things that you have done in your past? Do you find it hard to forgive yourself? Do you have difficulty moving forward in your faith because of guilt? And if so, understand that you're not alone. Guilt is a major hindrance for many people. And I'm not going to try to sell you on the idea tonight that getting over guilt is easy or that moving past your guilt is something that uh, it has a magic formula that you've just been missing out on. But I am going to sell you on the fact that you can and that you should move past it. If God has forgiven you, then certainly you should forgive yourself and move forward. A famous playwright by the name of Noel Coward decided to pull a prank one time. He sent an anonymous letter to 20 famous people in London. And to these 20 famous people was a note or a letter that said, everybody knows what you've done. You better get out of town immediately. And the story has it that all 20 people left town. How would you feel if you received a letter like that? I'm sure all of us have some skeletons in our closet. I'm sure all of us have some things that we have done in the past that we're not that proud of. And if we knew that someone else knew about it, we'd probably be greatly embarrassed. We might even want to leave town. In chapter 26, beginning in verse 14 of the book of Matthew, we find a man by the name of Judas Iscariot who goes to the chief priest and he says, What are you willing to give me to betray him, Jesus, to you? The chief priest and the elders offered Judas 30 pieces of silver. And from that point forward, Judas looks for an opportunity to betray Jesus. And of course, it came 
when he was praying in the garden. As he had finished, Judas approaches with several other men, and he kisses Jesus. And that was the sign. The one whom he kissed was the one that they were looking for. We also find another person who betrayed Jesus, a man by the name of Peter. And Peter, of course, denies Jesus three times. This same Peter who was so bold to walk on the water, this same Peter who said that he would never turn his back on Jesus, does so. In a moment of truth, he lies his way out of it. He does not stand firm in his faith. He does not stand up for Jesus when Jesus needed him most. Here we're presented with two apostles, Men who had followed in Jesus' footsteps, who had heard all about his teachings, who were there with him, and yet both of them betray him, and both of them respond differently to the guilt that they felt. Judas sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Peter squandered his opportunity to stand firm for the Lord by lying his way out of danger. Both betrayed the Lord. Both felt remorse for what they had done. And both felt tremendous guilt as a result of their actions. Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4 reads, Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. The last words of Matthew chapter 26 read, And he, Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Both Judas and Peter came face to face with the pain and sorrow of what they had done. Both found themselves collapsing under the weight of tremendous guilt and condemnation. Both realized what they had done, but that's where the comparisons cease. I want you to notice how each of these men handled their guilt. Judas decided to tie a rope around his neck and hang himself. He couldn't deal with the weight of guilt, the baggage that he was carrying around for betraying Jesus, for selling his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Peter didn't kill himself, but he had to carry around this tremendous weight with him until finally he had an opportunity to have that relationship restored. In chapter 21, of the book of John, Peter and the other disciples were out at sea when Jesus shouts to them from the shore. He says, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered with a no. And so he tells them to cast their net on the right-hand side of the boat and they will find a catch. So they did, and their net became so full that they were not able to haul it in. Then in verse 7 it reads, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Peter responds by throwing himself into the sea, and he begins wading toward the shore. These two men teach us something very profound in the way of dealing with guilt, and that is that the key is in the response. In 2 Corinthians 7, in verse 10, Paul writes, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Guilt is not always a bad thing. In fact, it can be a very good thing if it leads to doing the right thing. Guilt can produce godly sorrow, as it did with Peter, or it can produce worldly sorrow, as it did with Judas. It's all in how we handle it, right? When it produces godly sorrow, it leads one to repent. Or, we could say it leads one to fix what's going on and what is wrong. If you have a problem, you fix it, right? If something is broken, you fix it. And that is what happens in our lives when we are, when we are sinful, when we are caught in the trap of sin, we are broken. We must be fixed. But we can't fix ourselves. We can mess up on our own. We can become broken on our own, but we can't fix ourselves. We can't put ourselves back together by ourselves. Judas never reached that conclusion. Peter did. He had an opportunity to meet up with Jesus again, and he took full advantage of it. And we find in that beautiful story in John chapter 21, him on the seashore with Jesus, where Jesus restores the relationship with him. 
Asking him three times, do you love me? Then tend my sheep, right? Asking him three times, once for each time that he had betrayed him. Judas decided to take his own life because he couldn't bear the weight of guilt. Hopefully we never, never go down that avenue in order to fix our problem because that truly doesn't fix anything. Guilt can be a good thing. It doesn't always have to be a negative. When we have sinned, we need to feel shame for what we have done. One of the most difficult problems I had as a youth minister was we had a young girl that was 16 years of age who became pregnant. And it was a difficult situation because while she could very easily be forgiven of her sin, I believe that totally, she felt no remorse. She seemed to show no shame or guilt in her decision. And so it became difficult within the youth group because the young girls were helping her pick out baby names. They were touching her stomach. They were, you know, celebrating this with her, which, you know, the baby shouldn't have to pay for that, I understand. It wasn't the baby's fault. But at the same time, there seemed to be no, no shame, no repentance whatsoever. And the mother became very angry because the congregation wouldn't throw her a shower. They wouldn't seem to get involved and, and, uh, and share in the fanfare. All of that could have easily been remedied had she shown some sort of repentance. And the preacher that we worked with went to their house, sat down, talked with them. They felt that there was nothing wrong with the entire situation. You can see how that can be dicey, how it can be difficult within a congregation, within a youth group. Certainly, she, she could be forgiven, absolutely. But some steps needed to be taken. And when we feel the weight of shame and guilt, it should produce godly sorrow. It should lead to a point where we fix it. We allow God to repair what we have broken. Peter had godly sorrow, the type of sorrow that leads one to confess and repent of their sin. And the type of sorrow that leads to salvation. Judas had worldly sorrow. And that type of sorrow leads to nothing but despair and shame. The type of sorrow that eventually leads to spiritual death. In Acts chapter 2, we read of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. You know, this weak Peter, who had betrayed Jesus by denying him three times, becomes anything but later on in the book of Acts, right? It's amazing to see the the change in Peter and the other apostles. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter is preaching this soul-stirring sermon to people that no doubt evidently felt the weight of guilt and shame. And they say, brethren, what must we do? And Peter tells them, if you'll remember, repent, let each of you be baptized for the remission of your sins. In essence, Peter is saying, you need to fix it. You realize you've done something wrong. You realize that you need forgiveness. You realize that you need a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Here's what you do. You fix it. All of us need to reach that conclusion, whether we're outside of Christ or in Christ. We have a sin problem. We fix it. More often than not, we carry around this, this guilt. We carry around the things that we have done in the past. And that's what guilt does. It lives in the past. It reminds us constantly of all the bad that we have done. And Satan loves that. Satan would love nothing more than for us not to reach our full potential in Christ. He would love for us not to enjoy the blessings that come from being a child of God. But if God can forgive us, then certainly we can as well. Judas, like all sinners, had the opportunity to repent. Like Peter, he could have been forgiven. And all of it could have been forgotten. Jesus died for him too. But instead, he chose to deal with it differently. And rather than fixing his sin problem, he let it linger, he let it fester, and eventually rule over him. And he didn't respond correctly. Peter, of course, is the opposite. He saw Jesus and immediately tossed himself into the water. This time not walking on the water, but doing everything he could to get to Jesus, who was on the shore, so that he could have that relationship restored. Peter wanted it fixed which is why he responded the way that he did. But what we notice with Peter's situation is that Peter knew he couldn't fix it by himself. 
He could not fix his sin problem on his own. Responding successfully means understanding where to turn. Peter turned to Christ. And that's exactly where we must turn as well. Only he can remove the guilt of our sin. Only he can fix it. And if you hang on to this baggage until you can fix it yourself, you're going to be greatly disappointed because that's never going to happen. No matter how difficult forgiveness may be for us, it's not a problem with God. And the reason I can say that with full confidence is because the Bible says it. In 1 John 1 and 9, it plainly states, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can also rest assured that God does not use guilt against us. When we have been forgiven, that is it. Unlike human beings, many times, God does not hold it over our head. He doesn't remind us later on. Remember what you did back then? That's a human tool. That's not a God tactic. God forgives and forgets. Psalm 103 and verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a beautiful thought. That not only can we be forgiven by God, but that he will forget it as well. Satan desires for us to hang on in worldly sorrow. Let's don't give him an inroad. Let's don't allow him to use guilt as a tool to keep us from being all that we should be in Christ. Guilt has a tremendous impact on so many people's lives, and it has the tremendous power to keep us from being who God wants us to be. Letting go of guilt is about emptying my hands. There is nothing in my hands that impresses God. We have to come to God empty, broken, and contrite. Allowing him to fix us. You know, after the prophet Nathan had come to David and pointed out his sin with Bathsheba, do you remember that beautiful contrite prayer of David? If not, let's, let, let's read part of it. In Psalm 51, it reads, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He goes on to say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. And then in verse 14, he writes, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. We can learn a lot from these words. David was at rock bottom. He was at his own personal ground zero. The shame and the weight of guilt was heavy on his heart. And where does he turn? The only place he knew to turn. He knew he had offended a holy God. He also knew that that same holy God could forgive him. And so he bowed low with a broken and contrite heart and he prayed these beautiful words. I think the same David teaches us about fixing things in another psalm as well. In Psalm 32, starting in verse 1, it says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. David shows us the pain of guilt, but he also shows us that when you confess it before God, when you reveal the sin to him that he already knows about, that there is forgiveness. I acknowledge my sin to you, he says. Someone once stated that guilt is the result of the inner spirit created in God's image crying foul. When God's law has been violated, something deep within us 
should protest. We must listen to that inner shout. And once we've listened to it, we need to do something about it. Once we've acknowledged it, we need to confront it. Because if we don't deal with our guilt, our, deal, our guilt is going to deal with us. Notice the torture that David faced at the hands of his shame and guilt. He said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. That's exactly what guilt can do. That's exactly what sin does. It separates us from God. And the associating guilt causes us to lose vitality, to lose strength, to be burdened and weighed down. Acknowledging our guilt, confronting our, our guilt means nothing if we don't confess our sin, if we don't do something to fix it, and if we've acknowledged our sin, if we have confronted our sin, and once we have confessed our sin, then we need to forget our sin. You've heard me say over and over again, you know, we Christians are really good trash collectors, but we're not real good garbage men. We're really good at collecting the trash, but we're not very good at setting it beside the curb so that the garbage men can come and pick it up. We're not really good at throwing it out. We're good at collecting it. We're spiritual hoarders when it comes to things like that. We're not good at getting rid of it and cleaning house. But folks, how much do you trust God's word? How much faith do you have in his forgiveness? There's no reason that we shouldn't trust God. There's no reason we shouldn't believe that he can forgive us. You're not the exception to the rule. I know of people who have told me, Chris, I just, I, I can't come to church. Well, why not? There's no place for me there. God could never forgive me for all that I have done. And of course, I very kindly but very directly tell them, you're selling God short. And the God I serve can forgive anybody and wants to forgive anybody there is no amount of sin greater than his grace don't sell my God short and don't assume that you are the exception to the rule God wants to forgive and once he has forgiven he forgets it why don't you you know being a baseball fan there is a an old-time baseball player, a legend by the name of Gil Hodges. Some of you probably remember that name. After his playing days, he became a manager for the Washington Senators. And it, it was one occasion that they were on the road somewhere, and he learned that four of his players had broken curfew. He knew who the players were, but he held a team meeting and didn't say by name who they were and call them out and punish them. He just said, you four players know who you are. I'm going to fine each of you $100. Just put it in this box that I have sitting here in the clubhouse, and we'll forget the whole thing. The next day, he went to collect the money out of the box, and he found $700. Apparently, there were more than just four that had broken curfew. There were seven that felt guilty about it, and Gil Hodges said, I learned then that there were some people who had a lot of guilt weighing on their heart. I'm not going to ask you to pay a fine tonight. Because that's already happened. The fine's already been paid. Christ died so that you could have forgiveness and you could have freedom from guilt. Don't live in the past. Don't exhume that dead body that you buried in baptism. Be a new creature in Christ. Live for him. Don't look back. Look forward. Serving him with all of your heart. And if you need to fix something tonight, then fix it. If you're living with shame and guilt for unrepented sin, then fix it. If you've been forgiven, then lay it down and move on. And if you need to put on Christ in baptism tonight for the remission of your sins, then let's do that. Let's take care of that. Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and as we sing.